um, the key thing to think about is, you know, you've got multiple things. You've got your goals, you've got your essays, LORs, resume. Um, what, what we're trying to focus on here is what are the different, you know, wh where should you be focusing most of your time? So in terms of strategic positioning, um, I'd say the key thing is, is really forget about schools right now. Think about where you are in, in terms of goals and career. Like, where do you want to go? Why are you going to get the MBA? Um, why is the right time to do it now? Should you wait another year? Uh, how many years of work experience do you have? You know, admissions committees are so focused on the why behind the reasoning, the evidence that you need the degree. And for a lot of people, it becomes sort of a check the check the box, like, oh, you know, I'm just going to get the degree because I'm going to need it for a biography, you know, in, in, uh, in private equity or in consulting. But there's got to be a real, real need for it. Uh, some of the folks that I've seen over the years that apply, frankly, they don't need it. You know, they laterally could have gone there uh, to, to McKinsey or to Apple or to wherever. Um, so focus on the real deep down uh, thought behind, uh, do I really need a degree? Um, now, in terms of you know, test taking and all the different components, um, one thing I'd say is, you know, some people will say, well, should I take the GMAT, should I take the GRE, uh, should I take the executive assessment, let's say, if you're looking at executive programs. Ultimately, you know, there's much more parity now than ever than, than in years past when maybe the GMAT had presence. Um, it's really, it's really up to you. Some people score better on the GRE, some people score better than GMAT, but be careful with practice tests. Um, there, there's often this sort of idea that you take the practice test and you're scoring, let's say, 690 or whatever, and then you're going to the exam. There, there's not a tight correlation I have found between how well someone does in a practice test and how well they often do on the actual exam. So just be cautious in terms of you know your confidence. If you're feeling great or you're, you're not doing well, don't necessarily read too much into that. Um, I don't know why this is the case, but generally, uh, you know, the, the practice tests can be dated. You know, they can be from many, many years ago. Um, but I, I've seen so many people get frustrated either on uh, either, you know, sort of, oh my gosh, like, you know, I, I didn't do well. I'm never going to do well in the test when I get in the actual exam, but I just don't find much of a correlation. So take, do the practice test, but just be careful in terms of how much credence you give to your results. Uh, and, and so the weight of those results. Now, in terms of schools and where you know where you might go, um, there's sort of what I would call the marketing language of the website. So you go to the websites and you want to kind of put that stuff in your essays. And the truth is, a lot of top MBA programs all sort of share a very similar uh, kind of strategy in terms of you know the faculty or, or courses. The real magic, though, is in the kind of the values and the mission and like what lies behind the school, what's what's really below that school on that layer that they want you as an applicant to sort of dial into. So if you're a teamwork person, you should be focusing on I mean, you've been in team you know, oriented environments. You should be looking at schools that are going to value that. So a lot of applicants will get caught up in sort of, oh, the world class faculty of this school or that school. Everyone, every school has that. But they're looking for why. Why are you a fit? on our campus and why should we see you on our campus? So put yourself on the school campus by talking about them in a way that they feel valued. They understand, oh, oh, he or she gets us. Um, and a lot of folks just don't do that, especially when working with reapplicants. So we see their you know, applications on the first go around uh, and they're just kind of focused on, oh, you know, I wanna go to the school because it's got great courses and great entrepreneurship. So do many others, but get into the, you know, sort of the DNA of the school. Um, in terms of professional experience and how you're thinking about, you know, where you are now, you know, there's not much you necessarily can change in the next six months. Uh, maybe you'll get promoted, which is great. Adcoms love trajectory. So, you know, you, sometimes you'll see CVs and resumes where people are sort of in, you know, one year at this company, one year at another company, and they're kind of a, a bit of a roller coaster. That's not as bad or, you know, sort of uh, something to worry about as much as it is about, are you going like this? Um, are you are you plateauing in your career? Um, so think about that, and we think about it, and at least I think about it in, in a way that if you could say, well, in the next six months, what could I possibly 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 do to impact my company? Even if it's just one thing, is it a, you know volunteer something, doing something outside of work? Is it volunteering to do a project that other people you know don't view as sort of businessy? Um, sort of set yourself apart because so much, and this gets to the letters of recommendation, which we'll get to. So much of the application process is sort of you know, kind of benchmarking because everyone who applies to these programs works hard. They stay late. They get to work early. That's not that's not differentiating. Um, but what is differentiating is, oh, 
that analyst or that associate relative to his or her peers does it this way. And they, and then suddenly the, you know, ad comms are like, ooh, they're not just like everyone else applying. So you just wanna be thinking about professional experience in terms of how can I, dip, how can I kind of put a stake in the ground and differentiate myself a little bit more than someone else who's doing the same work. Um, so, you know, awards and you, know, you see on the slide here, awards and promotions, I'd say promotions are probably, you know, the, the key thing that they're kind of screening on and sort of your, your growth to date. Um, a lot of firms, especially consulting firms, will have awards, like strict awards, month, monthly awards, quarterly awards. Uh, there could be revenue awards based on, you know, someone's sales leadership or whatnot uh, in, in more of a corporate kind of sales environment versus like a trading environment. Uh, but I, I'd say it's focus more on you know, the quality of the work and how you're impacting change on a business level as opposed to being kind of a worker bee or a taskmaster uh, because highlighting just doing the work to the ad comms doesn't, doesn't really resonate as much as the business impact. So if you think about business, we've got revenues, growing, uh, growing revenues, cutting costs, uh, process efficiencies, um, sort of you know, changing the way something's done that helps bring in clients or helps grow assets or whatever it may be. Uh, so that's that's just an important way to look at the professional experience as opposed to, well, this is what I do every day, but I'm not really impacting the company at all or, or you know, wherever you could be a Peace Corps volunteer, wherever it may be. Um, extracurriculars are interesting. I, I'd say over the past six or seven years, um, not that they, they're, you want to go for sort of depth over breadth. So the idea of doing three different things outside work or one thing that's tied to your work versus something that you're doing consistently in, with depth, that's much more kind of the view you want to, or the, the way you want to approach it. Um, so someone will say, well, I don't do enough things outside work. It's not really things, it's a thing, it's one thing. Um, and are you really engaged with it? Are you, do you have a leadership role? In it? Um, and I would say that in six months or less than six months, there's plenty of opportunities to do things that aren't as formal as you might think. You could be uh, a developer that is helping someone, you know, with an app or a startup, or you're a consultant, you're a strategy consultant, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I'll help you with your business plan. You can be creative with it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be on the board uh, or have taken that kind of position. Uh, a lot of folks get caught up in, well, I don't formally, you know, I'm not formally part of an organization. Just create something. I mean, think about what, who you could impact um, outside work that's you know not sort of paid by your company um, and, and sort of have fun with it. Uh, so that's just something that I think folks get a little bit slid on. They sort of think that they have to be, you know, volunteering at this formal organization, not, not necessarily. Um, in terms of LORs, this is interesting from like when, let's say you were, you know, Pine University and you have, you know, someone who is of stature, could be uh, a donor, could be a political figure and they write a letter of recommendation. With MBA land, it's much different. It's all about details. So someone who really knows you, someone who has um, seen you kind of work due to a very detailed degree. Uh, so title, um, seniority, not as not as important, not as, as, as important as it might be when we were when we were younger and applying to, to university. So focus more on who has seen me perform, who has seen me work. Uh, otherwise, it becomes sort of very they become very kind of stale and generic. Again. Thinking back to the school fit and why a certain school and the values and the mission behind them, they're kind of looking at your letters of recommendation and starting to see, does that person, does that, that recommender really know the applicant? Um, and you see recommendation letters that are kind of very laudatory and praiseworthy. Oh, he or she works hard, you know, they stay late, as I said earlier, not differentiating. Uh, and the key, I mean, most of the, letter, the LOR questions tend to be pretty similar as you may or may not have seen through the applications. But the one that I think most folks sort of miss and the recommenders sort of miss and, and, and kind of waste an opportunity on uh, are the peer comparison one. So it's usually the second one and it talks about, you know, how is the applicant, how does he perform or she perform relative to his or her peers? And most recommender uh, recommenders will focus just on how great that person is in an absolute lens as opposed to the relative benchmarking. So it's, I have, you know, worked with over 20 years. I have, you know, managed associate consultants. Uh, in my time, uh, I've noticed most do it this way, and Jim or Sally do it that way, and they kind of hone in on the differentiating piece. So many folks just miss that, and they spend so much time talking about how Jim or Sally are great, but that's covered in another question. So 
you know, I kind of spent a lot of time on this because it's incredibly important and a lot of people really miss the opportunity to sort of say, ah, this applicant does it, but does it in this way. And that's what benefits the company. The other thing with LORs are, you know, this is business school. It's a master's in business administration. So the focus on things that are not really businessy, uh, sort of, it's kind of a waste. Again, it goes back to like the task work stuff or, or working hard or being diligent. That's great. Or you're organized or you have attention to detail. But what really, really matters is, is showing as opposed to telling where where you have shown, you know, where you have sort of exhibited that. Um, now, we talked about the resume a little bit. Um, I'd say that, yeah, it's going to be one page. Uh, that's a very important point. Uh, if you're an executive MBA applicant, you know, sort of late 30s, I'd say that you, you'll you probably have a two pager. Generally, the way to think about it is for every 10 years of work experience or so, um, you're going to be at a page. Uh, so for most of you applying, I imagine, uh, you know, in let's say 20s, mid 20s or so, uh, it's going to be one page. And, and you want to keep it such that it's not a not a bit not a job search resume so often when folks apply they're very you know technical bullets um these admissions committees need to understand what you do in your bullet you know bullet form but in a way that's not like they really have to work at it so typically like on a first resume screen or pass they may do on you they're going to be looking at okay functionally is this person a business development person are they a quantitative person are they a supply chain person but if you get kind of bogged down, if the bullets get kind of bogged down in really, really technical kind of business jargon, you see this typically with consultants. Uh, they're, you're just, they're, they kind of, as much as they like consultants and how they think, and I'm not just I'm not picking on consultants, I'm just saying, or if you have a deal resume, they're gonna get kind of lost in the weeds. So if you're investment banking or you know, you've done a lot of deals, don't build it like that. Build it in terms of leadership, managerial work. Were you a team leader? Were you a project leader? Did you did you grow a process? Did you change a process? Uh, did you bring in sales? Again, thinking about this as businessy as opposed to technical. Uh, and over the years, uh, having worked with uh, you know uh, semiconductor chip makers, um, folks that do work on stuff on our phones, you know, very technical engineering work. That's in the past, and it's kind of nice to see in terms of like maybe how you think or how you process things but what was the impact of working on that chip in terms of the business or the supply chain uh, so that's an important point don't get lost in or get too focused on the technical technicalities of your resume that's great for a job search but a business school resume very very heavy on leadership management uh, and and again business stuff sales costs whatever it might be if you you may have effective change in now the essays are, are sort of the anchor um as you as you think about your application and i'd say that um think think about right now as you kind of prepare over the next few months what are your greatest stories and hits what are your shaping incidents what are your inflection points it's a very very introspective and self-reflective process and when folks kind of first apply they're used to just saying oh you know i'll do the essays i'll you know, do, you know upload my transcript fill in the boxes on the online application you, you've got to really look inward and say, you know, obviously, why am I going? We covered that a little bit earlier, and I'll talk more on that. Uh, but what what is, you know, sort of where have I been uh, in my life? Uh, it could be traumas. It could be resilience. It could be failures, successes. Um, but think about where have you been and then say, okay, you know, what was my greatest challenge? What was my greatest leadership story? What was my greatest teamwork story? And then keep those stories and fit them to the prompts, so fit them to the essays. So if there's an essay about, Leadership. Well, that could also be your greatest challenge story. That could be your teamwork story. Uh, so don't be afraid to sort of, and even in your recommended recommendation letters, don't be afraid to sort of take the same story but look at it from different perspectives and share it with the ad comms accordingly. Uh, often people kind of read the essay prompts and they kind of force fit things in that really aren't, the, the, not really, really isn't the greatest story they could use for that. So have your greatest hits and then say, okay, where in the application to Kellogg or Wharton or wherever, I, can I get those in there? Um, that's one of the things about, we'll talk about the goals and I'll spend some time on this now. The goals are, are critical. Um, when I applied, first time I applied, I didn't get in the first year. Uh, I applied in round two. Uh, I talked about uh, sort of social impact and, and sort of um, entrepreneurial goals, but no real, I had no path on where I was going. Uh, I didn't realize, like I used the word explore, which is probably the worst word I could have used in the goals I said. They really need to see that you uh, have a riskless path to employment. So let's say you are a consultant right now, or 
you are uh, in uh, finance or asset management. Technically, you might want to do the career change and sort of say, well, I'm going to go work at Procter & Gamble or I'm going to go work at a, you know, a, high, a high growth tech company or a product manager. But they look at your resume and CV and they say, do the dots connect? Can, can he or she go and be a product manager if they were never in tech, let's say? So there is a whole mapping sort of done of where you've been and then how the MBA bridges where you need to go. So the goals are, are critical. Uh, I'd say the test score and your goals are sort of you know, the, the main highlights as you think about the components. Um, so as you prepare and you think about, well, how do the recommendation letters fit in and how to ultimately they're co they corroborate kind of who you are as a person and then who you are as a person, we hope we're gonna, is gonna come out sort of in the essays. Now the challenge with that is the essays for some schools don't really get to give you that sort of stage to, to kind of share your full self. So it'll be greatest challenge, short-term, long-term goals, and that's it. Or maybe, you know, diversity or international experience. Um, and that's where you say, okay, if I'm only going to reveal this much about myself in the essays, where can I get these other things in? Maybe, okay, maybe the recommendation letters, maybe in the resume, uh, maybe there's something in the uh, on the online application. But you again, you want to think about what do I really want to share with the school, and then how can I spread that out across the application components as best as possible. So you don't want a lot of redundancy. Your resume is going to have a lot of stuff about you know your business impact, your leadership. But you don't want to go write an essay that is regurgitating, you know, your six or seven years at a certain company or the bullet points that that support that. Uh, they need to see sort of the multifaceted person uh, that kind of is beyond the paper, beyond that one page. Um, the other thing is when you think of the opportunity to sort of share where you've been, um, there are there's a personal aspect. You know, everyone reviewing these, there are human beings reviewing you and reviewing your application. They want to feel, you know, there has to be some emotional element, hopefully, at some point. Maybe it's through the recommendation letters, um, but maybe, you know, maybe you had a time in your life where you did, you know, have an amazing athletic feat. Or uh, maybe you had a time where, you know, there was something with your family and you had to kind of go through a mental health issue. Show your stuff. There's no kind of judgment or bias there. Be who, show who you are. Um, otherwise, you're just another kind of driven type A person. Uh, that's you know applying to business school, and you know a lot of us are kind of wired the same way in, in, in some ways because we're, we're we're reaching for something more loftier than where we've been. But the person behind that loft and that goal, that's what they're trying to understand, and it's hard to do in an application and you know just these components. Uh, but as you think about the next few months, really kind of think about where you've been uh, and where not only where you're going in terms of the goals, but where you've been and then what supports. You know, what supports that is was it and was it a story that you feel could resonate with an admissions committee where, where, admissions committee where they might get you know they might tear up they might laugh uh over the years having worked with you know athletes or comedians or uh folks that develop uh, um, products in, in tech capacities or people that uh, were you know uh, into trivia and quizzes and whatnot just you know have your niche and kind of support it as best you can throughout the entire spectrum of the application. So with that, I will pause and I guess take any questions. Okay, so we, can we do Q and A at the end uh, once we are done with the presentation? What's that? Uh, okay, um, are yep. you done with the presentation? Yep, all set for questions. Yep. Please stop your uh, screen then. Okay. okay. Okay, and you can see user comments in uh, comments section. Yep. Yep. I also, also will display questions on the screen. Thank you. Okay, so I'm. I'm going to go ahead and start going through the questions. We've got a bunch here. Um, let me just start at the top, if you guys don't mind. Um, OK, so first one, uh, just get to. 
Yeah, so first one, what are other things which are really necessary to get into top B schools along with the GMAT and GRE? So the test score and the essays and the, your, your why, sort of the goals, are, are the most critical pieces. Um, I'd say that the, you know, the goals and the tests are sort of the anchor, as I mentioned during the presentation. So um, you know, who you are as a person in terms of leadership moments. So most, you could generally sum up and say, well, business school, or is lar business school uh, ad comms, admissions committees, are largely focused on screening on your, where your, your, your management potential is, is he or she going to be a leader? Are they going to run a division? Are they going to run a product line? Um, so for those of you that are sort of like, well, I've achieved a lot. I've had, you know, all these tasks that I've done and, but can you manage people? Can you get along with the people dynamics can, of, of a culture of a company? Uh, can you create a culture? Um, maybe in your extracurricular, or maybe, uh, you know, whether you're not profit, you sort of had to do that. So they're, they're always looking for ways that you sort of, manage people be up above and beyond the daily workflow and the tasks. So um, I'd say that that's a necessary thing. It's a critical thing to reveal somehow through the re letters of recommendation and through your essays is that you are not just a, a doer of work, but that you have managed work, you've managed people doing the work. Um, now, another good question. Uh, we have folks, by the way, from all over. Uh, and one thing I'd say is, um, well, here's another question. So is it possible to get into top B school as a fresh graduate? Uh, how would it affect later in the course period? So great question. Um, that's challenging. Uh, so I went back at 30, which was a little bit late. Um, I'd say generally you probably want to have three years of work experience minimum. I mean, I've seen two. Um, I'm seeing actually seen a lot more younger applicants over the past few cycles. But ideally, you kind of want to be in that three to four sort of you know, 27, 26 range. Um, but th one of the issues, again, let's think about the goals and employability. If you're 30 years old or 31 and you're applying to a daytime MBA program, the, the ad comms say, well, he or she wants to go be an associate of Bain. Are they too old, technically? Are they overqualified? And because, again, you're not going to get a job that hurts employment statistics and stuff like that. So um, you really want to kind of be, I'd say, th I'd say three years of work experience would be a good minimum. Um, so yeah, at right at, like, except for deferral, deferred programs, you know, like the two plus two, the Yale Silver Scholars program, uh, where you're actually in college uh, and you apply and you defer, I'd say generally you're, you're, you're going to want to have a couple of years, at least two or three years of work experience. Um, another question, uh, which round of admissions have more chances? Ah, great question. Uh, so uh, round one, I would say if you can, you want to spread your applications across sort of round one, round two. Um, over the past six or seven years, there's much more parity I've noticed in terms of, um, you know, is the, you know, are you getting the bulk of people in round one? Are you getting the bulk of people in round two? Maybe, and also because of the pandemic, uh, and we're seeing more round three. Typically, like I used to never work with clients on a round three application. Now, a lot. Um, I'd say definitely, you know, don't overwhelm yourself. Like don't do eight schools in round one. A lot of those deadlines, especially for some of the top programs sort of fall in that mid-September, early to mid-September range. It's just not doable. Even if you start, you know, in May of, of this, of the spring, uh, but don't get freaked out in terms of pressure and saying, oh, I got to make all round one. It's just not the case anymore. The benefits of round one generally are twofold. Uh, you have, uh, if you're on a wait list, there's uh, higher chances you'll get off a round one wait list. And then second, uh, money in terms of merit scholarship. So most of the money is given out in round one. Um, typically, the merit scholarships uh, are you're not going to you're not going to see money given out in round two. So th those are really the only major benefits of going you know round one. I'd say avoid round three if you can. But again, you know with waivers and test waivers being given out right now, you're you're seeing people apply now across the whole spectrum. Um, we're taking a gap from a very demanding job pair to pursue MBA affect the application? Um, great question. Uh, so typically what will happen is you might apply and then over that fall, let's say like next few months, you might say, I'm tired of my work, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave, which is kind of fine because your application's in, uh, the admissions committees aren't asking you if you're still employed. Uh, the trickier thing becomes if you're, let's say you last, last winter, you're thinking about applying now in the fall, and you're just in January, you're like, I'm leaving my work. That gap can be an issue. Um, they kind of like to see fluidity up until kind of matriculation. Uh, so 
Uh, be careful with gaps unless uh, there's a good reason for it. Um, and there are good reasons for it, but just be careful with that. Um, should every leadership quality described in an essay resonate with LORs? Um, so let me interpret that a different way. Um, your LORs are corroborating the rest of your application. So they're supporting things that they're seeing in your essays. They're supporting things that might show up in a bullet point on your resume. Um, but no, every leadership quality, it's better to show one leadership quality than try to get all this stuff in an application uh, and uh, kind of over overdo it uh, without having details. This gets to the classic thing with your essays of show versus, versus tell. So one of the classic tricks when you're writing your essays is using something like, for example, rather than saying, I'm, you know, I work hard or I'm diligent, show them that through an example. For example, there was a time when I led a team, et cetera. Uh, but the classic mistake that people make on essays often is that it's all basically, you know, I do this, I do this, I do this versus show us that you do that, and how you've done that. Uh, will an engineer who has no formal education exposure to finance and economics be able to survive in a top fee school? Yeah, that's another. So engineering applicants, a lot of you guys may be engineers uh, sort of by you know degree, uh, university degree. Um, engineering is sort of, uh, you're not an engineer anymore when you apply to business school. Now, and I don't mean that, I just mean don't sell your engineering skills. Uh, sure, you may have done well academically. Uh, it teaches you how to think a certain way, um, but don't don't sell it. Uh, focus more on how your engineering work affected the business and it brought in a client, developed a product. Uh, the problem that a lot of people I think face is that they sort of sell their domain. Uh, and if your domain is very technical, it's not going to work. Again, they're looking for businessy people. Um, next question, how to address gaps in employment and if the industry is such where there are contractual jobs, for example, drilling industry where you work on the rig. Well, I look at that as a, that's differentiating. Um, that's really a unique role, uh, Conmar. So uh, how many people applying have done that? I've actually maybe worked with one person who has. So suddenly that's attractive to the admissions committee. So, like they're gonna wanna get to know you. Ooh, we have someone in the class that worked on an oil rig. Whether it was contractual or you know, um, you know, sort of short term or you know, stints here and there, it's how you sell and talk about what you did. But again, that's to me, that's extremely differentiating. Uh, can you give some specifics for final year undergrad uh, students who wish to apply to deferred programs? Yeah. Um, how do you make your resumes attractive? So let me cover the resume piece first. It's not so much how to make your resume attractive as it is to why you're doing the deferred program. Um, oftentimes, and there aren't that many of them, and they tend to be sort of highly reputable, well-branded um, schools that offer it. So folks are just throwing their hat in the ring. They're like, oh, I'll just... You know, I'll just go do it because I don't know where, what I'm going to do next. It's so your resume sort of it's not so much work on your resume as opposed to convincing them that this deferred makes sense for you for some reason. And that's I think I, I do think the deferred programs are one of the more challenging applications to handle for folks, because, again, I think their their, their motivation is, is sort of they don't know what else they're going to do. yet. They don't know what their first job is going to be. So like, oh, I'll just I'll just go, you know, I'll go defer, you know, so or they're just trying to get into a top school and um, this is their kind of their, they feel like it's the easy way to do it. So a uh, bunch more questions. Hold one second. Uh, so let's jump to, um, yeah, I mentioned relatively riskless paths to employment be important to outcome. So given most consultants are around 26 to 28, is targeting consulting a risky path for someone matriculating at, at age 31? Yeah. So unless you were, and I've seen this often, let's say you were 10 years in the military in your 20s or an Olympic athlete, multiple Olympics, let's say. Um, those folks can kind of get away with it. But uh, I would say one thing about consulting as a goal is they prefer folks who have done consulting. Um, if you were at a Deloitte or an Accenture or Oliver Wyman or wherever, and you want to go do consulting, they're going to look at that person a little bit more favorably than let's say someone like me who was in finance. And now I want to go work in consulting uh, without any consulting skills. So um, that is how you, that's how you kind of view the most riskless path is, uh, what you know? What what do I have in my past that's going to support where I'm going? Um, and it's risky is also as you as you note here in your question about age. And uh, you you can be an investment banking associate at 31, but typically those are folks that maybe were you know flying helicopters in the military for 10 years. Uh, and I've worked with folks like that, so that they kind of get a free a little bit of more of a free pass, if you will. Um, so generally, how much time should we spend on essays, resume, and LORs? Uh, 
not sure what you mean in terms of time. Um, it's more how that how they all speak to each other, or do they? Um, again, your LORs are going to show your qualities, and hopefully, when they're reading your essays, they're kind of getting those qualities through you know your first person narrative story. Um, what is the minimum time one might have to uh, go, go to Alyssa? As someone with six years of post undergrad experience, what would you recommend focusing my attention on with regards to my application? It's a great question, Alyssa. I um, really, it's it's over those six years, were you kind of going like this or were you going like that? So again, trajectory, were you growing in those roles? Not so much, you know, I talked about promotions earlier. I, I, didn't, I don't mean to overemphasize promotions, but were you, I mean, did you have, you know, impact as you went over those six years or was it more like a worker bee, as I said, you know, someone who's a taskmaster, just doing the work that's been given to them. Um, they're looking for outliers. So they're looking for so six years of work experience is, that's a good amount. I mean, I had, I had eight, which is a little bit high in terms of the day, you know, daytime programs. Uh, but six tends to be sort of a good sweet spot. Uh, but really, it's what you've done, you know, in those six years. So again, if you were sort of promoted quickly, or you were uh, doing things that other people at your analyst or associate level, or your, you know, whatever your product manager level that other folks didn't do, that's going to jump out. Uh, what are the chances for mid-career candidates, forty years above, with very good job experience, along with seven hundred GMAT score? So what's interesting there is typically when you're when you're on that age the, the gmat score gre score just isn't as relatively important uh because they know you're busier you have less time to study uh but i'd say you know at 40 years above um you're definitely looking at you know a, a stanford msx or an mit sloan fellows uh an executive mba program uh would be you know the ideal fit um can i go give some specifics for final year undergrad uh, no we got covered that i think Let's see here um, someone said, does having a master of science in engineering with three years technical uh, engineering work experience increase the chances of an MBA admit? Um, so the question is probably, or the question is why, if you think about why would a master of science in engineering, um, be beneficial as an adcom looks at you in terms of business, unless it's tied to your goals. So again, anchor everything in your goals. If that master of science in engineering is going to help you be you know, better in your, you know, the, the, the short-term goal after, after business school, then yes. But it doesn't, having another degree or having a CFA or having, you know, CPA or whatever, a CA or being a doctor, that doesn't increase your chances. It just makes you more of a different, you're just differentiated. And how, again, does it impact where you're going to go? Does it make sense in terms of that path to employment? So having multiple degrees or having other technical or, you know, master's degrees, the biggest challenge is if you have an MBA, because some people will apply to MBA that have, especially in uh, India, for example, folks will have an MBA and then apply uh, to sort of, sort of you know, a more formal MBA program when they get older. And the adcoms are a little bit, not leery, but they're always wondering what, what is the catalyst for, for, for that application. Um, so product management from Big, Cor Big, Fo Big Four Consulting, um, is that a good career path post MBA? Uh, it, it is a good, well, it's more that, why what's driving that decision um product management is very popular now and typically if you think about product management and tech and technical world in tech world uh it's a blend of art and science so you're going to get folks that have some sort of technical background but also can you know be, be be marketers can sell that idea on the whiteboard i mean product management is really a real blend of you know left brain right brain and, and art and science so um if you worked in big four consulting what skills did you get from that that you know can contribute to uh, a successful product management role. Are GMAT GRE scores waived off for full-time academic associate professor working at university level? Uh, that's a great question and not one I can really answer. It's really probably on a school by school basis. I mean, there are waivers being given out now, uh, largely driven from the pandemic and sort of the testing environment. Um, but generally scores aren't waived due to stature or due to some degree. Um, it's more that the weight of them is different. So again, if you're in your late 30s and you're applying with a 670 to a top school, that's looked at differently than someone applying to a top school at 26 with a 670. Uh, let's see, does, uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, so what to do if my post MBA goals don't resonate with my pre MBA workplace? Yeah, from manufacturing uh, to sports management. Yeah, so I mean, sports management is a great example of, of something that folks want to do after school. Uh, limited programs in terms of you know putting people into that world, but I've worked with folks that worked on you know 
maybe it was the Barclays Premier League or the NHL or NFL in the U.S. Um, or uh, Olympic uh, stuff in Europe, for example, track and field. And they have a story that makes sense for sports management. But if you're just coming from, you know, a, a engineering background or a finance background or something background, you want to go, oh, I love sports management. It looks really cool. But if you have nothing to support that, that's going to be a tough sell. Um, well, my profile have lesser value if I give a GRE instead of GMAT. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so generally, there is no real difference. Uh, used to be maybe 10 years ago where I'd say maybe the GMAT had a little bit more of a preferen maybe preferential treatment, but sort of was just taken more. What's happened, though, over the past 10 years, a lot of folks are taking the GRE. So ultimately, gang, do what do well in whatever test you do. Uh, so if you, because I mean, folks do do better on the GRE sometimes than the GMAT for sure. And, and I've never taken the GRE, but just having you know been around it and coached folks on it. Um, so yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. Take whatever you you know your thing is, um, and uh, and you know do the best you can in it. Uh, Ten year experience, uh, apply for executive or normal MBA. Ah, uh, you're right on the cusp. Um, it's funny because I'm working with some folks right now that are at the 10-year mark. Um, I'd say generally you're going to be on the younger age of the average uh, de age dem age kind of de uh, spectrum. Uh, so 31, 30, that's going to be a little young for some of the executive programs. But be careful with, with how we term daytime or full-time or weekend or part-time. Schools are very different. You know, there's these global programs, these weekend programs, the part real true part-time programs. So you really have to find you know, where your niche is and where you match. Uh, and don't get so focused on the age such that you're like, well, I'm not gonna look at this program because I'm, I'm 30 or 31. Uh, it, it's a lot of it's marketing. I mean, a lot of these programs name things differently, but really are the same curriculum. Um, for, for test weight, are schools still ex ex accessing, uh, accepting scholarships? Um, so uh, I, I don't know, it's a great question. Um, I would say, I wouldn't, Make any connection between test waivers and scholarships for sure. Uh, if you have to, if you have a test waiver, you're not going to take the test for whatever reason. Don't associate that with um, whether you might get a merit scholarship. They're 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 not they're not really necessarily related. Um, so pointers on how to switch to a career in social impact consulting with a technical background. Uh, what do we look for in a potential school? So that's I mean I can think of schools right now where you might be a great fit, but it's all about well. What, what does that school offer to me curriculum-wise, faculty-wise, coursework-wise, program-wise, club-wise, uh, that's going to sort of get me into social impact consulting. Um, so when you say you have a technical background, focus on what, what, is, what was technical about it, but what have you learned in terms of business and what have you developed business skill-wise within the technical setting. So if you literally just work on semiconductor chips, that might be hard uh, to sort of sell from a business standpoint, but um, ultimately, you, you can eke out a lot of things, leadership-wise, business-wise, from even the most technical background. So, um, so I think, uh, can you dive into product management roles right after an MBA without prior experience in product management? Um, yes, you can. I think you can, yes. And I've seen that work for folks. Often, they may have done consulting work where they were you know, in a product management capacity, not necessarily PMs. Um, but and this goes for any position, gang. I mean, this goes for, you know, portfolio management. It could be supply chain folks. Just look at what you have in your background and say, ah, what, what's the connection between that and what I said I want to do as my short-term goal after, you know, after business school. Um, now, long-term goal, we haven't really talked about that, and I'll just touch on that briefly. You have a little bit more flexibility there. The key to the long-term goal is sort of showing um, sort of passion, interest, some sort of opportunity you see on the rise. If you want to be a CXO or CDO or CTO or start your own company, great. But show them that you recognize there's some opportunity out there in the business world. There's something that you want to affect change in, in consulting or in supply chain or in fintech. Um, stand for something. Put a, put, a, put a stake in the ground and then rally behind it. So is one month enough to prepare applications for two through schools post GMAT? Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. I would say you want to allow about a month for that number of schools. So yeah, you're, I would say post GMAT, no test again, no retake. Yeah, definitely. Um, so again, I hope this is helpful. Um, I've spoken a lot. I've spoken fast, so hopefully, uh, but I really wanted to cover as much as I could. Uh, I think I hit uh, most of the questions here. 
Um, but again, I uh, hope this, you know, this is helpful. The key thing as you think about the next six months or less, uh, whether it's round one or round two, um, really, really focus on how do you bring out your full self across all the application components, from the letters of recommendation to the resume, to the essays, to those bullet points, um, and show that you have you know sort of business potential, business prowess, and whatever that field may be. Um, so this has been a pleasure. I hope it's been helpful. Uh, yeah, and uh, great questions, and uh, I really appreciate your time.